I'm Pastor Jason Talsness. Welcome to the Sunday Sermon. Grace and peace be to you from our Lord God the Father in heaven and his Son Jesus Christ. Amen. As the seasons change, I gotta stand in different places here. Shelter from the storm. As I think about our church and what we have to offer our community, I don't wanna say that we're the place with all the answers. I think you'll agree that we don't want to be the place, that we're the place for morality and, you know, if you fall short of certain morals, you're not welcome here. Well, then what kind of place are we? What kind of place do we want to be? Cur curators of a liturgical tradition carried forward from the centuries? A social club? As I think about our image for who we want to be, I want to think about the image of shelter for the storm. Because there are storms out there that rage in the lives of our neighbors. We often go to language related to storms when we go through hardship. People say, my career is a disaster. My marriage is in shambles. My credit score is a mess. Stormy language for stormy times in people's lives. Even Martin Luther himself, the one who we, uh, whose insights on Christianity we appreciate and shape our approach to the faith, Martin Luther was in a storm. He was headed for law school, was in a storm. And he, uh, storms were very scary then. They didn't have the weather channel. They didn't understand them. They just random bolts of lightning would come down and kill people. And Luther prayed to God, if you save me from this storm, I will dedicate my life to you and join the priesthood. And uh, Martin Luther was spared, and he did enter the priesthood. He kept his word to God. A storm happens, and the church is a place of refuge from the storm. We are in beginning the third conversation of what we agreed as a community that we would do in this new year, and uh, we've had three listenings. We've been listening to God in January and February. We've been listening to one another throughout Lent in March and April. And we begin a third conversation that is listening to our community. What do our neighbors have to say? How do we approach this conversation? And I don't know about you, but I notice different things when new people are in certain areas of my life. For example, if I give someone a ride, I notice how my car needs vacuuming then. And I want to prepare you that as we listen to our neighbors, we might, well, what it is it that we're here for anyway as we talk to our community and listen to our community? How are we defined? So Jesus rose from the dead. What's the big deal? What's the result of that? And I want to say we can provide shelter from the storm, and I wanted to spend the next four weeks looking at the how that sh what that shelter looks like. And today's shelter is compassion. That people who are in the midst of storms in their lives need compassion. And when we look to the first Easter in the early church after Good Friday, when the clouds darkened and Christ hanged on a cross, you're supposed to say it that way, the disciples were nowhere to be found. Jesus' mother, 
The women, they were there. They put him in the tomb. The disciples betrayed Jesus, denied him, and they were gone. And here John tells us, on that first Easter Sunday, they are tucked away in a house, doors locked and afraid. They thought what they, the Romans did to Jesus, they were going to do to the disciples. So they sat there and they huddled in fear. And Jesus, as Jesus often does in the Gospels, just kind of magically appears in this home. And maybe you or I, we might say words of frustration with the disciples if we were Jesus, words of disappointment. You abandoned me in the worst time in my life. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus shows them compassion. Peace be with you, he says. Didn't settle old scores. He brought a word of peace. And then there was that one guy missing, Thomas, who doubted the story. And a week later, Sunday, Jesus appears in their midst and says, peace be with you. And instead of saying to Thomas, you doubted, what kind of faith do you have anyway? Jesus showed Thomas compassion. Touch my wounds. Feel my side. I am the risen Lord. And Thomas did not doubt, but believe. Jesus had compassion for the disciples, even in their doubts. Now, I like to talk about doubts and how it relates to our life of faith. We don't have time for that today. But there's a saying in the church that goes like this. That you can be compassionate or you can be comfortable, but you cannot be compassionate and comfortable. Which means to say that compassion has a cause. Now let's break down that word compassion. Calm meaning together or with, and passion meaning suffering. Remember how we hear the passion of Christ? That means the suffering of Christ. It's not just romantic love, but the word is in its origins meant suffering. Who do we suffer with for the sake of Jesus? And I have to tell you that I see a lot of non-compassionate Christians out there that get my attention. To the point where I just want to call a big time out and say, can we have just a big meeting here? Because you're on a different page than I am. You know, and I, do I really want to be in this club that calls themselves Christians, you know, when we've got that joker down in Florida who wants to burn the Koran? When we've got the people of Westboro Baptist Church protesting funerals and saying, despicable things about people who suffer. And I, trying to compassionately as possible, tell you that we Christians are known for our not being compassionate more than we're being known for being compassionate. And one person in my life, God bless her, Mrs. Stillwell, my brother and I would have to go to this woman's house after church, and she would watch us, and Mrs. Stillwell had kind of a daycare thing, and Mrs. Stillwell was a committed Christian who read us the Bible, and she prayed with us. But I can just say, in my memory, she never conveyed that she really liked kids that much. She would sit and knit and watch days of our lives and talk to the television like they were real people, and she was just kind of bitter and angry, you know? All I have to say, one thing to my brother, is just say, Mrs. Stillwell, he knows to raise his eyeballs, because he remembers that about his childhood. And one day, at our prayer at lunch, there was a little girl named Amy, a little redhead. I wish I knew what happened to Amy. Amy started to say something just as Mrs. Stillwell was saying, men and amen. And oh my goodness, everything stopped there, and Amy got what for for talking during a prayer. And I just, I think, I just, I wish I could go back in time. And say, Mrs. Stillwell, compassion. You got the Bible part down, you got the prayer part down, but where's the compassion? 
I think too often about time machines and conversations in the past, I think. And I think for every compassionate Christian you can name, you can also name another non-compassionate Christian. Something about us, people in the faith, in religion, lose track of that compassion question. We don't want to suffer with because we're religious. Those people aren't. And so I want to tell you, who is it that you have compassion for? Because there's all sorts of different people in the world. And because of your history and your experience, you have compassion for certain people. And I want you to think about that and be aware of it. Since my surgery on my foot in January, and prior to that, my difficulty in getting around, now I notice people and how many people walk with canes. I have compassion for them. I suffer with them, because for a little while, that was me. As a, parent, as a child whose parents are divorced, and as I went through the whole stepfamily thing, I have compassion for families that have been affected by divorce. It's just the way I'm wired. I've been through what they've been through, and understand what they're going through, and I care for them. My grandfather was a child of immigrants. His first language was not English, it was Norwegian, and he told those stories while going to school and not knowing the language. So I have compassion for immigrants, because I don't think of them just as foreigners, I think of them as, well, that was my family not too long ago, trying to make it in the New World. And look how awesome I came out because of their traveling to America. Look at the great experiences I have, thanks to people who left their home country and came. I'm just kidding about the awesome part, but I think you get the point. We are blessed to be here, and somebody in our heritage brought us to this country. How do we feel about immigrants? And think about the people who you don't have compassion for. Where is the reserve coming from? If they are suffering, what is it inside you and your experiences that make you reluctant to suffer with them? Tell you what, being Christian, people think being Christian means being narrow-minded. you got to broaden your mind because all these people are God's children. And can you have compassion for people that have divisions with you, divisions from you, people you prefer not to have compassion for? I used to be, as a pastor, less compassionate for people who would come to the church and ask for money, and I could smell alcohol in their breath. It was like, that was unfair. They get to start at 3 in the afternoon. I have to wait till 9, you know? Like, why are you asking for money for? Now, when people are drunk or high and hurting, now I say, what is the pain that motivated that person to medicate that pain, and can I help that person? I've grown a little bit, believe it or not. That's called compassion. Because there's a saying in the church that you can't be comfortable and compassionate. Compassion has a cost. To suffer with someone means you may have to overlook, go over your attitudes and your prejudices to suffer with another person. And no talk about compassion is complete without a modern phenomenon we have, which is called compassion fatigue. Where we as Americans and improved communication methods are constantly being bombarded by people in need. I mean, you know the formula now, right? Nat a natural disaster hits an area. Made for TV special where the celebrities go on TV and ask us to dial a number and call in and donate. And then we got those commercials with the herding animals on it and that Sarah McLaughlin song, Arms of an Angel, and it just breaks your heart. And then you see the UNICEF, you know, feed God's children, starving kids in Africa, and for some reason I kind of feel worse for the animals than the people, and that just ain't right. But I feel, you know, those cute little animals, I want to help them. I think we get kind of tired of all the people who are hurting and in need and they have their arms outstretched saying, help me and give me money. What do we do with that? Did Jesus help us with this question? You know, someone asked him, how many times must I forgive my brother? Seven times? And he says, no, 70 times seven. That is, there's no end to the forgiveness. And I think that Jesus is inviting us into a life of compassion. Now, having said that, 
Boundaries are a good thing, you know. Can't fix everybody, can't fix everything. You know, we could go, when I drive past Grace Fellowship, is that huge church on uh, Ronald Reagan, and sometimes I drive by in a weak moment, I think I should go over there and talk to Pastor Buddy and say, hey, where's the little Lutheran church down the road? Fellow Christians, can you spare a minivan for us? You know, 18 passenger vans so we can take our kids on a youth trip. You know, you're Christian, we're Christian, don't you have compassion for me? What Pastor Buddy say? Say, sorry, buddy, love you. Not going to give you a van, right? You know? I don't think it's always compassionate to give someone cash who asks for you, money from you. You don't know where that cash is going. Some people struggle with addiction. Jesus never gave cash to anyone in any of the Gospels. He did. You know, there's that story of the Good Samaritan, classic story of compassion where the man on the road is beaten, and the Samaritan, the outsider, the half-breed, goes and takes him to the innkeeper and says, I'll pay for him and whatever other further charges I'll give. So I'm not saying you can't give money to help people, but you don't give it directly to the person necessarily. There's a saying that you can't be compassionate and comfortable. Either compassionate or you're comfortable, because compassion has a cost. It's inconvenient. It costs money. Yet the Bible is clear that compassion is not an option. When we think about what does compassion have to do with God, it's that verse, John 3, 16, where it all begins, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. It's out of compassion for the world that God sent Jesus. And then, Jesus showed compassion everywhere he went. He showed compassion to those who were hurting. He had compassion for the crowds, it says in the Bible, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion for outsiders like Samaritans and Syrophoenicians and Romans. Outsiders to his clan he had compassion for. He suffered with them. And there are so many passages that talk about love. And compassion is connected to love. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong and a clanging cymbal. Whatever we do as a community, it needs to be done with compassion. There's a verse in Galatians about someone in the community who's sinning and they need to be confronted by the rest of the community. And you're supposed to confront that the transgressor, quote, in a spirit of gentleness. Compassion. You cannot be compassionate and comfortable. Compassion has a cost. That cost is love. And when we look to Jesus and his suffering with, we are invited to suffer with the world. Now, are there limits? How far can this compassion thing go, you might wonder? How, you know, kind of think of a scenario. Could you be compassionate to Hitler, for example, or... Could you be compassionate to a sociopath? I mean, this is where the Bible's going to take us. Because there's compassion, and then there's enabling and endorsing. My wife went to a conference, and she came back with this story about a storefront church that had started in Louisville, and right next door, they learned, was a brothel. Okay? And they met this guy at the door of the brothel, and he says, I'm a pimp. You have a problem with that? And the, the, the story is, is that they showed him compassion. They did not endorse what he did. But they stayed in relationship with him until the point where he became baptized and other prostitutes became baptized and they left that way of life. Now, a lot of us would say, brothel, I don't want anything to do with them. They're bad people. End of story. But because these folks somehow were able to love them and yet remain composed, lives were transformed. Jesus 
died on the cross. He suffered with us in his passion, in the crucifixion. And he rose from the dead. Compassion has a cost. You can't be comfortable and compassionate. And it all starts with Jesus Christ and the compassion he has to the point of giving us his life so that we may live. And then he rose from the dead to show us what resurrected life looks like. Whatever we do as a community, whatever you do during the week, may your life reflect the compassion that Jesus has for you. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.